with the rise of podcasts, vlogs, and influencers, there are now more ways than ever for people to consume content. This presents an interesting challenge for marketers who constantly need to find new ways to reach their target audience. To talk more about this, we are joined by Lebu Lion, a podcaster, speaker, and influencer. Lebu is the founder and host of the thought-provoking Lebu Lion Show. She shares some insights that marketers should be aware of in the ever-evolving digital media landscape. We talk about the importance of authenticity, the power of storytelling, and the need to build relationships with influencers. So for me, I feel like marketers should be thinking, clearly people are content driven. They go to places for what they get from something, not for what it is. So how do we find other hubs that have that value for our consumers? Before we dive in, hit subscribe to join our tribe and lend us your street cred by sharing this episode with your network. This is the Lead Creative Podcast. Welcome to the Lead Creative Podcast, where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers, and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Mungi Simtati. Enjoy the show and please share and subscribe. Yeah, well, thanks so much for making the time to talk to us on The Lead Creative. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me, Mongezi. I've been looking forward to this. So, yeah, can't wait. Awesome. Um, Lebu, thinking back to your childhood, were there any signs that you would end up in marketing? Not at all. I think, or let me say in, in the, my formative years, you know, um, I was a very shy child. I didn't speak most of the time. So my parents are surprised that I make money from using my voice because yeah, I never used yeah. to speak at a ch- as a child. I think there was even a, a time when I didn't speak for six months and they actually had to take me to a speech therapist to figure out what's wrong with me because I just didn't want to speak. Um, so I think my parents were just praying that I'd, you know, grow into a normal person get a normal job and and just be normal because they felt like I was a very strange child. Um, I, I was their introduction into a lot of firsts, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I don't yeah. think there was a lot that said, they will become a speaker or they will become somebody who does things in front of people. Sure. But I did grow up in an entrepreneurial family. So they did teach us entrepreneurship by making us work in some of the family businesses, you know, whether it was a puzzle shop or, my dad offices because he used to have a a medical scheme type of business so we'd be in there like they they lots of different touch points in terms of entrepreneurship that i got exposed to as a child um so i guess being an entrepreneur yes there there are there are points in my childhood that show that i could have done this but in terms of being a speaker and being in front of people there's absolutely no sign (laughs) that i would have been this person (laughs) today (laughs) Yeah. So, so where did where, where did that change occur for you, or what was that change? So, a lot of people always ask me, "How did you come up with the name Lebulain? Is Lebulain your real name?" And I say to them, "No, it's not the name on my ID, but it's definitely the name in my soul." You know, um, I'm not Lebutau. There's none of that. I'm a random girl, yes. and my name is very long. No one would ever expect that to be my name. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Lebulain yeah. is definitely my alter ego, but it comes from the moment that I realized that I had to change my life in order to become who I felt like I was meant to be. Because even as a child, I felt like I was meant for something bigger, but I didn't know what that was. And being shy and not having friends made it harder to believe that, even though I could feel it, Mm -hmm. you know? So I got my name Lebo Lion because I think it was in grade, grade six. No, no, not grade six. Grade, grade North or grade one, right? Uh, we had to do a play and it was a play about yeah. animals in the jungle. So mm-hmm. in order to give me a bit more confidence, my teachers made me the king of the jungle. They made me the lion in the jungle. And then I had my lioness wife and it was a whole little cute situation. The only job I had in this play was to roar. Like I had to have a really loud roar at some point yes. in the script. So so basically but, you found your voice. Like it was it was it was a it was one of those situations where you had to use your voice when previously you hadn't had to. Well, 
I had to use my voice, but I don't think I found my voice then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because so I had to roll, right? And you know, as kids, they do the the we do play we 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 practice, right? So every time I practice, they'd say to me, "Okay, it's your turn to roll." And every time I'd roll, mm. it wasn't loud enough. It wasn't powerful enough to these teachers. So they were like, "This girl is not going to roll on the day. She's just not going to make it." So instead, they changed the entire play. Instead of making it about the courage, the 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 cor- courageous lion, they made it the cowardly lion. And so instead of roaring, I had to purr. Mm-hmm. And it became like a comical play, right? And obviously that's embarrassing for a child. And I don't think the teachers were aware at the time that they were doing that. I think for them, they were just trying to accommodate me because I clearly seemed very shy, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. where the name Label Lion comes from because I had to reclaim my power after realizing who I was through my journey of growing up, that actually I yes. am the courageous lion. I can roar, you know, cause that, that, that moment really scarred me. Um, and I kind of kept it in my heart for a long time. And I think I embodied it for a while before I broke the chains free. And I finally found my voice in grade six. You know how in certain schools you have to do speeches in English every year and they yes. mark you. Yes. So yeah. every year when we would do speeches, I would literally get so nervous. I'd start crying in front of the class. I'd be standing in the front. And everybody knew that every time Libra comes up, it's a mess. She's not going to be able to say her speech. And it got so bad that my parents had to ask my teachers if I could do my speeches at break or after school because I was too nervous to speak in front of my peers. Mm-hmm. So me and my yeah, speech yeah. marks was like for 50%, you know, 55%. And I think they were just being nice to me (laughs) to get me to pass. Uh, And then after that happened in grade six, I just remember thinking to myself, I never want my peers to look at me and laugh every time I come up. I don't want them to see me this way because I'm not this person. So during the school holidays, what I did was, instead of like playing outside with all the other kids, I lined up all my teddy bears and I wrote a speech. And I learned the speech and then I started saying it in front of my teddy bears. And when we got to grade seven and it was time to do our speeches, I was ready because I'd been practicing for so long in front of my teddy bears. (laughs) So it was time for me to say my speech. I envisioned my classmates as teddy bears. And I said Mm. my speech. And when I opened my eyes, when it felt like I opened my eyes, um, my peers were literally standing and clapping. Right. And my teacher looked proud and I was like, this is so strange for me. I'm not that girl. And I remember getting, I think it was like 97% or something for that speech. And it wasn't a sympathy market. I actually did so well. I even got selected to be part of uh, some public speaking team. And literally that's where my public speaking journey started off. So I've been competing as a public speaker since I was 13 years old. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've been in the trophy team for my school. And the trophy team is a selection of the top three speakers in each school around the country. We yeah, compete yeah. and then whoever wins goes overseas. So I was like, oh, <laughs> and I taught myself how to speak. Nobody taught me. I had yeah, to yeah, become yeah. the lion I think I knew I was. Now, fast forward to today, you run a successful podcast, The Level Lion Show. What led you to start that? Having found your voice or at least discovered your voice as a child and building that up over the years, what then led you to starting the podcast? Because, of course, you had been doing marketing before. You know, you had been doing a lot in this space um, before you started the podcast. And then you started the podcast. And we'll get into some of the intricacies of, of running the podcast alongside your mar- other marketing work. What led you to start it? Because not everyone who works in this field also runs a podcast. Yeah, so I've never actually worked in corporate. My experience of marketing comes from really temporary experiences that I would have with different companies, agencies, design houses, that kind of thing. And then through my own business, I started a tech company straight off diversity with my cousins. And we found ways to raise money. We were selling weaves. We were doing a lot of things. And I learned how to be an aggressive salesperson. My aggressive is just not to be afraid to sell, finding different ways to sell, you know, uh, going and finding stock outside of the country, all of those kinds of things. I learned that through that business. And when that business eventually, I mean, we did, we did decently, we did quite well in terms of being a black owned tech company that's selling software and hardware. We did pretty well as young people. 
But when we got our first round of really big money, I think it showed who our, what our personalities were and what our priorities were. And because they weren't aligned, we decided to go our separate ways. So I think I was about 26. I had a bit of money and I was trying to decide where do I go next? What do I do? Um, and I've always wanted to go to the Cannes Film Festival, etc. But I've also always been the kind of person who goes to different environments just to network and get to know different people. So I'd find myself at random coffee shops in Joburg, meeting creatives and other marketers. And they say to me, every time we speak to you, we hear marketing in a different way. And it's so cool. Like, yeah, you should really yeah. consider starting a podcast. And I was like, no, mm. I'm not going to start a podcast. I want to be on radio one day. Who cares about podcasting? And at the time, podcasting really wasn't a thing in South Africa. Um, but I found myself in Cannes because I was going to Modem, Modem and the Cannes Film Festival. I found my way there. Don't ask me how that's another long story because I'm a hustler <laughs> at heart. So I find my way to places when I'm interested in going. And I remember being in my hotel room and thinking, I've got nothing to do. These people in Joburg said to me, I should consider doing a podcast. What have I got to lose? Let me just record something on my voice notes. So I recorded my first episode on my voice notes on my iPhone in a hotel room in Cannes, Paris. I mean, France. And uh, I posted it. A few people were listening. I thought, okay, this is, this is interesting. It's not a big deal. I think I got 100 streams or something at the time. And then I did my second episode still in Cannes because I was there for three weeks. And um, I got more listeners and I thought, okay, clearly people are interested in what I'm talking about. Let me continue this thing. But I didn't actually take it that seriously. I just thought I've got yeah. nothing else to do for now. Let me just play around with this thing and see what it is. After my third podcast, I got publishing houses calling me and saying, we've heard about your podcast. We're seeing it. Would you like to come in and consider writing a book? And I was like, what? From these three voice note recorded podcasts, are you yes. serious? They yeah. were like, yeah. yeah. And opportunities, the tree started streaming in. And that's when I said, okay, maybe I should take this thing seriously. And so I did. And that's how my social media pages started growing. That's how everything started growing. That's how I started to say, let me brand myself as who I am, you know, as label yeah. line. Because before I was many other yes. things. Um, yeah. But that's why how I started podcasting. It was almost accidental. I didn't actually understand the power of it until my third episode. And then I realized that this is a big deal. And I remember getting onto the iTunes top 100 charts um, from my third episode. And I was on it consistently ever since. <laughs> I was the first black woman, black African woman to be on the charts. You know, I did quite a lot at the time on podcasting because a lot of people weren't doing podcasting. It was before yeah, the vlog yeah. casting era. It was just podcast, audio, talking to mm -hmm. people, talking mm -hmm. about things. And that's how I got into podcasting. Now, as a marketer, you of course, of course you've done, you know, of, of course you've done the marketing, you've done the the podcasting, and now the book was in the works. Um, fast forward again to today, how does podcasting in your view fit into marketing or at least the modern marketing landscape as one, as you've come to use it, and also as you've seen collaborations between yourself and brands working. Yeah, you know, the podcasting landscape in South Africa is really dynamic. I'll use that word instead of interesting. Because yeah. you find that we're not necessarily, and this could be a sweeping statement, but from my observation and experience, we're not a country that embraces innovation and change very quickly or rapidly. You know, we kind of take our time. And so you find that something will be really big all over the world. And in South Africa, we're just starting. And when it's kind of losing its relevance everywhere else in the world, we're, we're just starting to feel comfortable adopting it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I find that with podcasting, corporates didn't really embrace the true essence of podcasting, which is the right. audio format, right? I feel mm. that vlogcasting made them feel more comfortable in investing in podcasting because it looked like a TV show to them. So it was easier for them to understand what this thing could be. I found that on the campaigns I've worked on, the, the companies will usually tell the PR department to work with podcasters, but the PR department doesn't actually understand what new media is. I don't need, a lot of them haven't even understood what the term, they don't know the term exists. And this is in 2023, and I've been getting podcast partnerships for the past four or five years. 
And every mm-hmm. time South African or African companies come to me, they don't know what new media is. So they almost compare it to radio and television, but in the wrong ways. They use the wrong matrices to, to measure the value of both things. And I've also found that they find more value in radio because of the fame element, right? So my bosses yeah. understand radio. The people on radio are commercially famous. Therefore, this is a trustworthy platform. Instead of saying, yes. but what is on radio that makes it a valuable pl- platform? Because people aren't listening mm-hmm. to radio for radio. They're listening to radio for the content. So for yes. me, I feel like marketers should be thinking, clearly people are content driven. They go to places yes. for what they get from something, not for what it is. So how yeah. do we find other hubs that have that value for our consumers? You know, right. I don't think they see podcasts as media. <laughs> I think they almost see it as, as like a, a social media in the way of Instagram or Twitter. Right. Not right. as mm-hmm. a mm-hmm. media platform for not, advocation. Yeah, not as its own sort of sta- freestanding media platform that exactly. has its Exactly. Exactly. That. So so on yeah, so on that, how should brands approach collaboration with podcasts or podcasters differently to how they approach advertising on other platforms like radio and traditional spaces? What is this thing or this these these sort of pitfalls that you generally tend to see and experience when a brand approaches you which is different to how they should approach someone like you someone who who runs a podcast like myself or anybody else who is in the non-traditional space yes i think what brands need to do firstly because as marketers it's our job to be the most innovative people in society as an art and engineers that's our job we need to see things before they come. We need to invest in them before they blow up because that's when you get the most return from something, right? When you invest in it before the market starts to run to it. So for me, I would love marketers in South Africa to be trendsetters instead of trend consumers. And I'd also want them to be people who view new media. So your podcast, your vlogcast and that kind of thing as media and social media combined. And so it actually gives you double the value that traditional media would give you because not only do you have the media element. So, you know, where we can have conversations, content hubs, that kind of thing, but you've also got the social media element, which is firstly, you can get real data, real analytics, you get real time comments. You get to see how people really engage with the content because the comments last forever. And unlike a radio show, what do you get? There's so much permanence in new media. You know, once I've posted my vlogcast or my podcast, it's there forever. I'm, I'm unlikely to delete it, which means there's actually a lot more perp- perpetual value in investing in new media than there would be in investing in traditional media because it's very one time. You know, it's a one off yeah, interaction yeah. and it's more expensive, mm-hmm. right? So I would say if you're going to be a marketer in South Africa who wants to engage with new media, you have to see that it's got double the value that traditional media would have. Sure, also, sure. there's a lot more play. You can experiment more. You can have longer term partnerships for less money. But you also have to understand that if you want to build the connection with the audience, which is what new media does so well, it has a great connection with the audience, mm-hmm. is that you have to be authentic about who you partner with. And I found that a lot of marketers and companies are looking at the numbers instead of the value. So they'll say, this person has 500K subscribers, therefore they've got a valuable podcast. But it's like, no, what you're selling isn't valuable to that person's audience. So how, how about you find podcasters who are creating the content that's valuable to your consumers and then you partner with them because that's where you're going to get real results. That's where you're going to get your clicks, your sales, your engagement. It yeah. doesn't just come from the vanity matrix of how many subscribers or how many listeners. It's not that simple with new media. Now, you've said a lot there. And I think one of the things that I'd like to pick up on is the the, the uniqueness, I suppose, of the podcast proposition or new media proposition as you put it 
for an audience or for a marketer that's trying to connect with an audience, right? What are some of, what would you say are some of the unique opportunities to connect with an audience through a podcast, through a podcaster in comparison to another platform that would say have a lot more viewers? Because as you put it, it's not always, it's not always about the, the number of eyeballs, but about the value in the connection that you make with an audience. So what is this unique value that you would say a podcast, podcaster or influencer, which we'll get to, offers that's different or uniquely valuable to a brand or marketer? So that's a great question, right? And I wouldn't be level line if I didn't speak my truth. What I believe needs to happen more in our industry is our marketers need to be more educated in the things that they don't know. You know, they need to immerse themselves in social media, and new media in ways that they never have before. So not as consumers, but as researchers. And I think when you do that as a marketer, you already be able to see opportunities that most people can't see because that's our job. That's what we do. Right. But for those who don't, which is the majority of marketers, what they need to start thinking about are the traditional marketing principles we've been taught. And the thing that I think about the most is your minimum viable audience, you know, capturing that market, that segment, the minimum viable audience, the people you need to make things happen that will allow you to tick all your boxes. It's not the biggest group. It's just the most important group, your core group. You have to think of them because they become your, what's the word? I keep losing words these days, but they become your tribe or your core audience. Your your tribe, your evangelists, you know, they're the ones who will evangelize about what, whatever you're selling or whatever it is that you want them to engage with in a way that's more authentic than anybody else. The problem with a lot of companies is that they're doing that whole pray and spray method. So we want to reach as many people as possible because we actually don't know how to create a strategy that targets the right people. And then we hope that what falls from our prayer and spray is the right people. And if it's not, we'll just ask for more budget and try again, you know? So for me, it's, we need to educate our marketers and say to them, understand how these platforms work and understand that they're strategy driven. And if you're going to find true value in those platforms, you need to connect with people for more than just the platform. Because as we've seen with social media and new media and even traditional media, as the world evolves, platform is becoming more ubiquitous. We're seeing new platforms every single day. So what makes platforms unique? It's the audience and the creators right? The creator economy is gaining in value every single day because those are the people who lead the tribes and companies are trying to access the tribes. So when you're looking at a podcast or an influencer, you should be saying, who is their tribe? Do I want access to the tribe? And if that's the case, then I need to work with them in this way. It has to be a strategic partnership. It has to be long-term. The long-term element is the most important because unlike traditional media, People online have a relationship with the person, the host or the influencer, and they feel like they know that person. So when that person partners with the company, they will question the partnership. They'll say, but why are you doing this? But if it's organic and it makes sense, they'll even be happy to support you because they're like, we want you to win. This makes sense. You've always spoken about dogs. Now you're partnering with a dog company or dog insurance company. We love it for you. Let's go. You know, so not only have you captured a tribe and you understand their interests, in getting to know you, they know your interests. And some of them even acquire your interests just because they love you that much or they trust you that much. So this is a very yeah, dynamic yeah. relationship. There's so many layers to it that corporates can play with and use to really get their brands to have authentic touch points with different people. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. Now, on this idea of um, of influencers or podcasters or hosts leading tribes, as you, as you've just put it, um, can you talk us through how you plan your podcast as well as your general social content and how you align that content with your other marketing goals? Because 
as you, as you've just put it, I mean, there's there's the fact that you lead a tribe, but there's also the authenticity that you mentioned, mm-hmm. and you kind of have to be authentic across all platforms, right? Whether you are whether you are are doing your podcast or whether you are doing influencer work or whether you're doing anything that you're doing. So, how do you plan this content? Um, both the podcast, social media, and align it with the authenticity that you kind of want to communicate and maintain? So for me, the the brand growth was very clear for me in the sense that, A, I'm a marketer. So <laughs> as marketers, we create differently to other people. You know, it's just sure. how we're wired. And when I came up with the tagline, the voice of marketing, it was already a visionary statement for me. Because my goal at the time was, how can I be the voice of all things marketing? A podcast is a great touch point to be a voice. You know, a blog is a great touch point. Being a speaker at corporates, training, I'm still a voice. My brand is voice. (laughs) That's the first thing that I do and the first thing that I stand for. And what that voice communicates is up to me. I get to play now because I want people to hire me and work with me as a voice. My leadership is through voice. It's not through anything else. You know, that's kind of how I establish my brand. So for me to create my podcast, for example, I've been evolving with the times. Whatever's of interest to me, I put it in my podcast because I always bring it back to the marketing. That's the foundation of what I do. But because I'm using my voice, my audience doesn't mind growing with me in anything I choose to do if I'm using my voice. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So even on my TikTok, for example, the fact that I, all I do is talk. <laughs> I just talk on my a TikTok. I talk about marketing, but I will align it with pop culture. So I'll talk about reality shows. I'll talk about the Barbie campaign. I'll talk about whatever's happening because as a marketer, I see marketing and everything. So for me, it's also about showing people that marketing is all around you. So in anything I do, as long as I can bring it back to marketing is all around you, for me, that's the common thread that links all of my content. And I know most creators don't do it like that because they start by building platform before they build themselves as the brand. But I did it the other way around. I built myself as the brand and then I built everything else around me. And I think a lot of us, if we are hosts or influencers or whatever we may be, we should start doing that. I really believe in personal branding. It's something that I teach. It's something that I talk about a lot. I think more you can get more out of personal branding than you can get out of platform because everything exists because of you when everything is made sure, because of sure. you. But if you make it because of platform, sure. it becomes a bit trickier. You know, you want to have the kind of influence that can hop on different places and still maintain its integrity and still have some kind of a followership following it to those places. So I believe in that. And I think it's also very interesting because I come from a academic and business background. But because I built everything of mine online in terms of my podcast and my personal brand and my thought leadership, so many people who have a similar background to me almost look down on that because it's built on social media. And I I want to urge anybody who's listening to really rethink how they see social media. You know, if I was somebody who'd been working at a radio station and I I grew from that radio station, you wouldn't be saying the same thing, but it's exactly the same thing. In fact, it's less potent to grow on radio than it is to grow online. My reach is international. Mm -hmm. My reach is international. Somebody else who's in South Africa has only got the reach of the station. Not only that, but they don't own the platform. So if the station decides to fire them, they're irrelevant tomorrow, you know, unless they know how to do something to make themselves more relevant. But I created my own platforms, so I get to decide how I move, where I move, who my tribe will be. And not only that, but I don't have third parties in between me and negotiating with advertisers and partners. So all the money I make is mine. <laughs> I don't have to split it <laughs> with anybody else, which is great because yeah, then you have that yeah. independence. I mean, people don't understand. I booked my entire life. 60% of what I do or the income I get is from my social media platforms. It's from my podcast. It's from my Instagram. It's from my TikTok. It's from my YouTube I make real money from that, but I have a lot more time than everybody else does, you know? So I found ways to optimize my life simply by using technology that's accessible to all of us. So I'd say rethink the idea of doing things traditionally because that limits your runway. It limits your reach. It even limits your potential, you know? But once you're online, I mean, when I started, for example, most of the companies were paying me were American companies. 
South African companies didn't get it. <laughs> you know, I was mm. making my money overseas. I only just started making money here, I think, a year after having my podcast. Then they started to say, okay, we see that this person in the States was invited you. We can invite you too. You know, so you don't want to limit yourself as somebody who's got a voice or who's got something to share by only being on traditional platforms. You want to be on new media. You want to be on social media. I want to I want to just unpack something a bit more out of what you've just said. I want to unpack this idea of um, this international audience uh, to start with and also just monetizing your platforms because that's become a bit of a big thing. So a question that I asked um, another content creator um, in our previous season was how do you how do you manage or monetize collaborations and partnerships when as you as you as you've repeatedly said right you're based in South Africa you are here and it's likely that because of proximity the brands that are likely to 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 want to work with you are likely in South Africa and yet you have call it a 20% South African audience or 30% South African audience and 70% international audience. Mm -hmm. How do you get into those conversations around monetizing this audience when, for instance, um, brand, um, computer brand X or phone brand Y that's trying to build a South African audience? How do you, how do you manage those types of conversations to say, my audience is predominantly all 30% South African, 70% international, but you want a South African audience. Therefore, let's approach the conversation this way. How do you do that? That's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to disappoint a lot of people because they have to understand that my premise of everything is that I am a marketer. My job is to know how to do those kinds of things. I came into an industry that already facilitated my skills. This is the perfect place. If you're a marketer and you want to do anything online, it's the perfect place because it encompasses everything we should know how to do. So for me at the time, especially when I started, the analytics weren't that important to companies because they didn't really know what podcasting was in South Africa. And the American companies that were booking me didn't book me because I'm South African. They booked me because of my content. So they didn't right. care if I was reaching an American audience or whoever. They were just like, we like your content. We're going to book you to speak to our team because we understand what you're saying and they need to learn this. You know, so they found the value in my podcast and they found ways to use that value. I didn't have to prove anything to them. They just said, we love this. We love your ideas. Come through. Are you available? How much do you charge? And that's what I found the differences with South African companies and companies overseas. They don't listen to podcasters for the podcast. They listen for the value. Mm -hmm. Then they say, okay, yeah. this person talks about cars. How can we work with them? Do we make them review a car that we have? Do we make them the host for a car show? What do we do with them? They see you as the thought leader of the thing you talk about. And like here where they valuing you against your platform. So they, and there's so many examples where a person has greater value than their platform. You know, I'm one of those people. I have, I think 6,700 subscribers on YouTube, even though I've got videos that might have 25,000 views or whatever, sure. but I'm more of a thought leader and I've made more money than a lot of people who have 500 K. Uh, subscribers on YouTube, you know, who might be working as influencers with brands. So I don't think a lot of brands understand and people understand that there's a difference between the value of the person versus the value of their platform. And that's why you can find that there'll be somebody with lots of followers, but they can't convert anything. They can't even really yeah. influence anything because they don't really have a tribe. They just have followers. And there's a difference. Yes. You want to invest in a person with a, a tribe. So how do I communicate my value to companies? First of all, I talk about my tribe without talking about their location. I think that's very important. I believe people are brought together by similar interests, values, etc. So it shouldn't matter where in the world the person is. If your product serves their interests, it's going to be relevant to them in some way, shape or form. But if a company says, but we want a predominantly South African audience because we want people to buy, then the conversation becomes more complex because we sure. know that to get people to convert, so to click, to buy, 
it's a it's a deeper conversation and it's a more rep- repetitive conversation mm-hmm. than if mm-hmm. we were just mm-hmm. amplifying a product. So you can't mm-hmm. come to me as a company and say, we want people to buy. We're only going to pay for one podcast. We're going to have a banner and we're done. It's like, no one's going to buy. <laughs> I know yeah. you think I have a great aud- uh, relationship with my audience, but people aren't just going to buy from seeing you once on my podcast. We sure, need to have a sure. relationship. I need to show them why I believe in you because podcasting is almost like unveiling the mysterious veil of social media. People feel like it's that yes. raw part of it. So you yeah. can't glam it up and just advertise. Buy this. No, people don't care yeah. about that on podcasts. They want to hear the, the truth. That's why vlogging yes. works so well because you feel like, oh, this girl's in her bedroom. She's talking about this product, so it must be real. You know, so mm. I think brands also don't understand that if you want that real interaction, people have to see this person engaging with the product more than once or engaging with the brand more than once. So I also talk to them about the difference between the long-term partnerships, short-term versus what their goals are, right? And then also Mm. I try to create safety for myself. And I think a lot of creators don't do this where you must not allow a brand to tell you what kind of content you need to produce. Because I find that a lot of the time when creators do that, they lose the essence of their work and the audience drops when they talk about this product or engage with the brand. Yeah, because, because it's also it's that, too- that sense of that loss of authenticity that, that, exactly. you, that you referred to yeah. earlier. Now, there's something, that, that, there's something that we find challenging um, in, in terms of these relationships and, 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 and finding the right people to collaborate with, right? As marketers and as people and agencies, as well as brands. <laughs> so let's say as an example, my client is, call it Telcom, right? And, um, <laughs> and uh, of course, Telcom is trying to, yes, build awareness, raise awareness, build relationships with audiences, stand out in the marketplace, all of these things that all these brands want. That said, they are they are predominantly in South Africa as a network, yes. so they are wanting to 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 reach out to that uh, kind of audience. Now, in terms of in terms of these conversations that you have that are less location focused and more more, I would say, mindset focused or community or tribe focused. Mm-hmm. How then does a telecom make the decision to go? with you versus somebody else who is who is i i want to i want to say who runs a zulu speaking podcast whereas yeah. when zulu is predominantly spoken in south africa so you know that the audience will be predominantly south african yes. then how do you balance that kind of conversation and say i lead a tribe and this is the mindset and the personality of the tribe versus i lead a tribe that is based predominantly here You know, the reason why I keep talking about working with people based on the value they provide and not the platform they have is because if as a brand, you can see label and say, the essence of this person works for our company, you can take her off her platform and put her in front of the telecom community. And you'd be surprised that when you put the right people in front of a company's existing audience or customer base, that the audience might even shift their mindset and feel more inspired to buy, feel more inspired to engage with the platform than they did before previously, you know? So what I sell to brands as well is the fact that I am a thought leader, is the fact that I do touch people in certain ways. And that's why I keep saying to people, don't sell platform because then platform becomes about who's really watching, da 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 all of those things that will limit how you can work with a brand. But if you say to a brand, listen, I've got a voice still. And this voice works because look at all these things that I've built. And this voice can still work with your audience. It's just that on my podcast, your audience might not be there in the size that you want them. But on Instagram, they're there. (laughs) And they listen to me. So how do we work together to make sure that we can touch those people? And it's so interesting that you use the example of telecom because I worked at telecom yes. before, not as a podcaster, but as a speaker. Mm-hmm. And I trained the right. radio VJs to unroll a campaign that telecom was doing, right? Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing is most of those VJs who were part of native speaking radio stations invited me onto their radio stations to talk to their audience, right? right? And they're mm-hmm. there, the Swati, Kopsa, Zulu, Sutu, but they felt like, 
because of the knowledge I have, I can help shift the mindset of the audience. And I wasn't even speaking those languages because I can't speak Gosa. I can't speak a lot of those languages. Yeah. But it's so interesting because on most of the interviews that I did, we had phone lines buzzing. Like we, people were calling. They asked me to come back because they'd never heard someone like me and they were looking to hear about the things that I teach. So I think a lot of the time for me, I've got proof to show brands that, listen, it's not only about my podcast. There are different ways you can work yeah. with me. But my voice is what sure. resonates with people because I know how to connect with people. And this is how we can do it. So sometimes I will give them different ideas. This is how we can do it. And these are the kinds of results you're going to get from it. So I'd say to creators, be the brand, you know, make sure that the value of everything you have, your platforms comes from you and not the platform. If YouTube were to die tomorrow, you should still be relevant. If Instagram sure. was to go tomorrow, you should still be relevant somewhere. You know, um, also gauge your influence. So I do this when I go to events. If I'm speaking somewhere, I've just been invited to be a special guest or whatever. I gauge by how many people will come to me and say, oh my goodness, I follow you and X, Y, Z. So I see that there's real life influence on the ground influence sure. that I have. You know, I also gauge how many people will contact me post event who didn't know me. Or, you know, the kind of things I get invited to afterwards. It shows you the appetite of the different audiences. And, and I note that down. And then I will pitch it to brands and say, look, I know this podcast doesn't have this audience that you want, but here are my other platforms. So here's the other stuff that I do that does touch those people, you know. Or I can plug into this program that you have. And trust me, I can convert these people. So you have to pitch to the brands based on your value, you know? And even over time, my, the, the demographics of my podcasts have changed. You know, they went from international to half international, half local to predominantly yes. African and a little bit international, yes. you know? And then right. it went from only women to men and women to lots of men. So it, it changes over time based on what you do and how your brand evolves as well. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. You also work with SMEs um, and of course SMEs have different kinds of budgets to the big brands that you also uh, also work with. So with kind of with that in mind, how can small business leverage influencer marketing or at least leverage some of these platforms that we've spoken about for their growth and also how can big brands then enhance how they are currently doing it or improve how they're currently doing it so smes i actually when i started the Debo lion show right i designed my content by asking myself what would who would i want to serve what would i want people to know from whatever I'm going to share on this podcast. And because at the time I was really passionate about small businesses and entrepreneurs, I said, okay, I'm going to use this podcast to democratize access to information because I feel that a lot of small business owners don't have access to the information that a label would have or can't afford a label to consult for their company. So if you listen to the first two seasons of my podcast, it's literally like lessons, real lessons, lectures. That's why publishing houses were calling me to say, but you're basically serving textbooks in every episode. So we might as well put that into a real book. And I've even got lots of emails. I mean, over 2000 emails from different entrepreneurs saying, I got this many sales because I listened to this episode. I secured my first big client because I listened to this episode. So the first thing I always say to people is listen to the podcast. The first two seasons are a marketing textbook, a marketing masterclass about how do you do you use marketing and digital tools to build your business, to build your brand. That's the first thing I tell them because it's very complex. It's difficult, it's difficult to give them all of those tools in a podcast interview or podcast conversation. Sure. You know, so I always say to them, find those tools, research, do as much research as you want, uh, sign up for some skills programs that you can find online, just so that you have a, a decent understanding of how the online space works. And when it comes to working with influencers for SMEs, I'd say 
You really need to focus on the value that your business gives to the market when you're a small business. Because your job when you start a business is to build that loyal tribe, that minimum viable audience. And a lot of the time you find that that minimum viable audience is built through you creating a product that they care about, that they want to use, and that they want to share with the people around them. So if it's good enough for them, they'll share it with the people around them. And we know that word of mouth marketing is the most powerful kind of marketing you can have. Sure. People trust other people. They buy a product because somebody else recommended it more than anything. And I think influencer marketing is just a more elevated idea of that kind of word of mouth marketing, right? But it's mm. also more expensive because you have to pay these people in order to amplify your product. But if you really want to work with influencers, make sure that you've got the right connection. Pick a person who fits your product. Don't be like big brands and just go to people because of their numbers. That's not going to help you as a small business. What you need is, is this the appropriate connection? Is it authentic? Does this person speak to the values of my company? Do they believe in the product? Because if you work with an influencer who believes in your product, they're more likely to actually work with you on a long-term basis at a lower fee because they want to build with you. Right. So it's those kinds of things where I say to entrepreneurs, really try to find a good match with that person. Make it very real. Don't look for them just because of their numbers. It, it won't work for you. Even if it does on a short term basis, it's not a long term strategy and you'll feel like you wasted money. And then for the big brands, I'd say if you're going to work with influencers, please be more mindful about who you're choosing and what you're asking them to promote or what you're asking them to sell. I find that. In Africa, especially, we have a very numbers-based uh, economy Approach of scale yeah, yeah. mentality. So everything is about how can we get the most? <laughs> how can we be seen by the largest audience? How can we make? And it's like, but it's not always like that. You know, even when you want to have a broad amplification strategy, why are you just going to everybody? You have to be intentional. You should be able to justify. I went to Michali because she can do X, Y, Z. I went to sure. whoever because she can do X, Y, Z. And in my experience training corporate teams, I find that they don't do that. So they just pick goals because I really like her feed. I remember seeing a study two years ago and it spoke about how marketers will choose platforms to work with and influencers to work on, work with based on the platforms they use socially. So you yeah, find there's that, a lot of that. Yeah, there's yes. a lot of that. That that if if I understand a platform, I'm more likely to yeah. choose influencers who also use that platform. Exactly. Like now, there's threads. A lot of people yes. won't understand threads, so they won't pay influencers who, so they won't who are pay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah, real yeah, study, yeah. and I think it was something like 85 percent of marketers do that. So it's not even mm -hmm. platforms they understand. Platforms they consume, which is different. Consumers sure. don't always understand. Sure. That's scary to me. Yeah. So it was mm -hmm. saying that's why you find that a lot of marketers who right now the ones in decision making positions are millennials, right? So millennials are on Instagram. They love Instagram. And you're finding that most of the influencer marketing spend is going to Instagram influencers, right? Because right. that's where most marketers are. But the problem is not only that it's going there because Instagram can work if you make it work, but that they're picking their favorite people. So it's not really a strategic decision that they're making. They're saying, I really enjoy this girl's content. Therefore, I think she'd be great for the campaign. Instead of saying, does the organization fit with this person? You know, and it was, I remember speaking at a, a very big alcohol brand. The head of marketing called me through and she said, she's a bit of an older woman, maybe in her 50s. And she said, Lebo, you're the same age as my team. And you're in digital marketing. Come speak to them because we're creating partnerships that aren't really delivering on yeah. your ROI, you know? And the first thing that I saw when I got there was the makeup of the department that handles the influencer marketing. Sure, it's sure. largely characterized by people in PR and then a few marketers. And I think that's also where they're making the mistake. The skills you learn acquiring a public relations qualification are not the skills that you learn acquiring a marketing qualification. I think you get more business information and tools when you do marketing than when you do public relations. And you find that people who study public relations in South Africa usually would have gone to a college or something like that. So the, the kind of thinking that is existing in those teams isn't really leaning towards sophisticated strategy, to be honest, right? These would be people who need a lot of leadership when it comes to strategy, when it comes to being educated about how new things work. 
And so that's also why they would lean towards picking people they like versus people who fit the organization. Because in their minds, they also can't really figure out what would I be measuring to see how this person would fit with my company. You know, she's working with a million brands. So that means she can work with any brand. So we're going to also work with her. (laughs) You know, that seems to be the mentality around many corporates in South Africa. So I would just say we need to also invest in training our teams in corporate about the online space, about influencer marketing, new media, all the different platforms. In fact, if I was in a company that had a very big budget, I'd say you need a TikTok team, you need an Instagram team, you need a a, a podcasting team, you need teams who are highly specialized in these different platforms because they work so differently. And you can't just have one group of people who are going to know about using all of those those platforms? It doesn't work, you know. So I, I I wish that corporate would invest more money in training people and getting them to understand how these things work, and then also the leaders interrogating the decisions before the decisions are signed off, you know, because it doesn't make sense to call label once your team has spent ten million rands and you say my team's making the wrong decisions, but who's leading the team? You are, you know. So there also needs to be that level of accountability for me. So on that uh, on that team makeup um, part of things, is it only the, the team makeup or is it also the level of collaboration among the people from different disciplines where if you come from a mark if you come from a predominantly marketing background versus a, a, a PR background, if you collaborate more, a lot more value can come out of that. And also not just collaborating within the team, but finding opportunities such as they did to collaborate with somebody like you who mm-hmm. comes from a, with a completely different perspective. And, and the reason I ask this is because I'm trying to, to, to find out whether the value well, what the value of collaboration is or has been in your experience with some of these teams, right? Because you may have a TikTok team, but a TikToker is probably a much better suited person to 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 be on that TikTok team. But it's likely that they won't be because they create TikTok content. So what's the value of these types of collaborations? And have you seen any things coming out of it that are valuable for brands? Yeah, you know, that's a brilliant question, Mungesi. And I really believe that corporates in South Africa, and I'm speaking about South Africa because this is where I have the most experience in terms of understanding the organizations within. We really need to reimagine marketing, right? Because most of these things stem from the marketing department. When you're talking about new media, you're talking about influencer marketing, all of these things, they're coming from the marketing department. It's not the responsibility of other departments. So I think what we're doing right now is we are treating marketing like we did 20 years ago. But the landscape has completely changed. So we really have to reimagine what a marketing team looks like. Is it a young team? Is it an older team? What would the leadership look like? You know, those are the kinds of things where I think they we're not there yet. So our leaders can't lead because they don't have the tools to lead a team that would be able to be effective in this kind of world. They're not bad leaders. They're just not the right leaders for that. Do you get what I'm trying to Mm -hmm. say? And so because leaders who don't understand the landscape are hiring, they're hiring people who also don't know how to navigate the landscape because they're hiring based off of outdated criteria. <laughs> but if you have, let's say, a label line and she's the CMO of X Bank, I would definitely go and find creators to employ, first of all. But then I would also find people from academia who have certain kinds of experience to employ and put them in a team. And then I would probably want to go find somebody from an agency and bring them into lead. Because someone from agency would understand somebody who has more of a corporate background and the creators, and they'd be able to understand both languages and bring it together. But I can do that because I've also run my own agency. I've also run my own tech company. I've hired lots of people Mm -hmm. and I've been an agency. I'm also a creator. I understand corporate. You know, so how do you find label lines to be the leaders of the team when most corporates are looking for people who just say, I've been working at X brand for 15 years. You know, and I'm, yeah. so I'm going to be the leader of this team. I think that's where the, the trick is first. So from a point of collaboration, then it becomes, even if we say collaborate, are we collaborating yes. correctly? <laughs> you know, if we don't For have sure. the foundations to understand how to collaborate, then 
collaborating just becomes a performative exercise because we want to say we're trying to be better. I would say yeah. the real job starts within the organization for them to reimagine mm-hmm. marketing, sure. understand the yeah. landscape. There's so many research companies you can go to that will teach you this thing. And then re- change the hiring process, you know, really change it because we need new talent. We need fresh perspectives and we need to also change the, the designations we have in marketing departments. They've really evolved ov- overseas. You know, you yeah. have an, a head of technology, um, a head of the content, for example. Here we don't have that. Sure. It's one person <laughs> who's yeah. the head of yeah. running all the leaders of those things. It doesn't make any sure. sense. Sure. You know, so mm-hmm. for me, that's where collaboration can work. But we need the right mm-hmm. people facilitating the collaboration. So a question that comes up for me is... If you hire all these people, and and I, I like, I, first of all, I love that approach, right? <laughs> hire people who have the background and and who have the 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 on the ground kind of experience. Love that approach. Now, with that, if I were to play devil's advocate, if you take Lebu Lion out of what she's doing today, and you take her into a an alcohol brand, and she's podcaster, content creator, marketer, um, author, all of these, all of these really great skill sets that she brings into the team. Three, four years in, as she works with your team, is she still as relevant? Is, does she still know as much? Is she still, um, you know, because, because you cut your teeth doing this. And the reason that makes you so cutting edge, so sharp is because you do it every day. Mm-hmm. It's not because you step out and go work at a brand and stop doing this. If you stop doing this and you start looking, um, you start becoming an outsider looking in, do you retain your relevance? Also, another great question, you know, <laughs> and that's also why hiring the right people is so important. And I know it's one of the hardest things for organizations to do. So I'm not saying it lightly. I know there are lots sure. of challenges there because even for me in my business where I hire 10 people, it's really difficult trying to find the right people. But yeah. what I will say is that if you hire the right people, what we understand is that unlike other industries, the online industry moves so quickly. There's no way you could create a relevant campaign in Jan that would still be relevant in December. It moves that quickly. So by virtue of the industry and the way it is put together, you have to always be on top of the game. You have to constantly be researching. You have to constantly be figuring out what things are. And for me, if I got to work at a brand and they really incentivized me, I'd hire somebody to be my trend analyst who would keep me up to date about what's going on and give me Mm -hmm. opportunities to experience these things in parts of my day so that I stay relevant. For sure. You know, but that is leadership. That's what you do when you're a leader. And I even do that now because I don't have time to think about who should I invite on my podcast? What should we talk about? I'm really not there. I'm doing too much. Mm, so yeah, I have somebody yeah. on my team who does that for me and they send me the information. Before I go to bed, I read about what's happening that's current now and I and I get to know it, but I won't know from my own uh, doing because I'm not there anymore. I post and I leave. I post online and I go. Yeah. You know, yes, but there's yes. somebody who says, before you go to bed tonight, just be aware of these trends that are happening. So yeah, we can incorporate yeah, them yeah. into the podcast. That's how I've learned to run my organization that keeps sure. me relevant. Because a lot of the work I'm doing now is very corporate based. I'm speaking at corporates, I'm doing keynotes, I'm training. It's just work where I don't need to be focusing on the online space to be doing that. So I need someone to keep me relevant. You know, I even schedule social media time into my schedule so that I can actually sit on TikTok for 45 minutes <laughs> and see what's mm-hmm. going on, see what's yeah. trending. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that's the whole point of it. And even if an organization ordered, um, hired somebody like me, I've already got my following. I'm not just going to let the following go because I've been hired. Sure. Which sure. means that if I can strategically position myself as the new hire in this company, blah, 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 it will elevate my social standing, which means Mm -hmm. I will get the popular people following me. I will get them coming to me anyway to want to work with us, which keeps me in the loop. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So I don't think you actually become irrelevant. I think you can become more relevant as long as you put the right systems in within your team that help you stay on top Mm -hmm. of trends. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Lebo, thanks so much um, for your time. You've mentioned that I suppose brands should be should 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 partner with people based on the value they bring rather than the platform be less uh, pl- be platform agnostic really and partner collaborate with people that way keep yourself relevant get the right people into places and positions um know what's happening know what's um what's on the ground and understand that um influencers podcast hosts and people who are in these positions lead tribes what else or what's the one sort of final thought that you have in mind in terms of how brands can make their creative work more compelling, whether through influencers, through podcasters, or even outside of those spaces? What's the, what's the missing link right now or, or what's sort of the one thing that they could add to become more compelling as brands? I really believe that we are entering the era of people-to-people marketing, you know, so there's no longer... C, C to B, B to B, none of that, right? It's just people to people. Because of the way that technology is evolving, we're getting a deeper understanding of the individual and not just the group of individuals, which means that companies need to focus on being more authentic, not only because they want to reach a person, but because the person is also going to interrogate them. People aren't seeing brands as companies anymore. They're seeing them as almost human manifestations of whatever. So manifestations of their feelings, something, but they're seeing you as a human manifestation of something. They're judging you based on criteria they would judge another person off of, not what they judge another company off of, which means that companies have to humanize themselves by being more authentic, by being more selective of they stakeholders, you know, who do we partner with? Uh, which brands do we collaborate with as this company? People are going to be watching that because they're going to see your, your company as an extension of who they are. And they're going to feel rewarded by a company by how well you understand them, right? So this means that as companies, we need to invest in technology that really gets us to understand our customers' true needs, true ones. They real the experiences, each individual, not just the group. Uh, And this means that companies can't do the prayer and spray method because people are going to see right through that and say, I'm not, I know you're sending this message, but that's not me. It's only one part of me, you know, invest in departments that care about people and that know how to understand people and get the right information about people. So you can humanize the connection between you and your customers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lebu. That was yeah, that was amazing. Um, yeah, it, yeah. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot out of that um, yes. that a lot of us could learn from. And yeah, thank you very much for making the time. Thank you, Mongezi, for having me. You asked the most amazing questions. Thank you for listening to the Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter, on at Mongezi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongezi.com.